Hello and welcome to this new episode of Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers podcast. I'm Mathilde and I'm your host. I'm an inner transformation mentor supporting women in healing mother wounds through women's circles and through the one-on-one 10 weeks program. To know more about these offerings, check out my website, womenreclaimingtheirfullness.me. Now for today's topic, we're talking about dealing with truth telling from a narcissistic mother. So let me start by asking you, how many times while growing up has your mother told you she knows best? How many times does she still use sentences like, and that's the truth? Or, I know exactly how these things work. Or, I've been here longer than you, don't pretend to know more than me. Or, I'm your mother, I know everything. How often does she use these way of these ways of saying and does any of it sound familiar to you has this been your experience maybe the words used by your mother by bit might be different as you know they all have their own ways but if you have grown up with a narcissistic mother chances are you have experienced some versions of truth telling no matter the topic she knows best or she has a strong opinion, that's the right one to have. And she will find evidence to support her point at all costs. Looking back on my own life growing up, I can now tell how my mother only spoke by through telling. I didn't know at the time, but as I look back, I can definitely see that. The reality she saw was the only reality that was true and acceptable, and she still does that. It's just... um, For those of you who might be new to this podcast, you might know that already. I have been no contact for over two and a half years. So if I'm speaking about my mother in the present, in the past tense is not. uh, She's still around. She's still alive. And she still does all these things, but not to me anymore. (laughs) Um, So she, she always spoke by through telling. She always saw reality in a way that she believed was 100% objective and totally right. And she spoke with such conviction that there was no arguing. And as a daughter, I knew better than to argue, of course, because I could see how she got with anyone who did argue with her. So these people that maybe didn't agree with her were inevitably labeled as absolute idiots. Uh, not worth of her consideration and so she would just cast them aside or fight with them so not ever wanting to be seen like that by her I let her truths be mine too but it is not as simple as that uh, because her truths and this as well might be something that you might be familiar with with your own mother Her truths changed all the time to suit the moment, creating a lot of confusion for me. So it wasn't just a thing of going with whatever her truth was, but this truth kept changing. So something I was maybe rewarded for agreeing to one minute, I would be put down for the next. Again, maybe this was your experience. Um, You can share with me your experience by emailing me at matilde at womenreclaimingtheirfullness.me and you can also share your questions there via email. So let's have a look at how truth telling by a narcissistic mother can look like. There's different aspects, different ways that that these can manifest and you might have seen a little bit of everything or maybe your mother was more like the type that did one particular thing I'm just gonna give you a few uh, a few examples so one way is always speaking by absolute truths as I mentioned like my mother did seeming unable to consider that it could be her subjective point of view or or experience you're never gonna hear her start a sentence with in my own experience this is what I feel. No, it's not. It's it's the truth. This is just what it is. That's how every sentence will be like. Um, another way is if she actually indeed can get to the little bit of understanding that maybe it is her opinion, but 
still she will say that it comes from the most absolute experience and therefore it is inarguably accurate so if even if it's her opinion it's still like the absolute truth it's like an inarguable opinion another way is constant commenting on things so maybe she doesn't go headstrong with one opinion but she sort of lets you know what she thinks by constantly passing comments on things in a way that is to bombard you with reminders of the truth that she wants you to take on another way is remarking on evidence of you straying from the truth so whenever you're doing something different than the truth that she just says it's the thing um, she will point out your inevitable mistakes sort of as if to say if only you had listened to her truth this would not have happened Another way is, is collecting evidence to strengthen her truth, regardless of the source. She's not going to worry about if the source is actually reliable or someone that, that really knows what they're talking about. It doesn't matter. As long as they are evidence, they're offering evidence that supports her truth, she's going to go with them and use that. She will associate with people who believe in the same. And these people can also become flying monkeys if need be another way she can go about it is completely denigrating casting aside and going as far as publicly destroying anyone who does not agree with her truth if you don't conform with her truth you may soon find yourself labeled as the black sheep or the bad one in the family or the daughter who she didn't manage to educate properly you name it and another way that she can go about it is using those absolute truths to describe you and label you, declaring that she is the one who knows you the best. And so whatever label or whatever descriptive she sticks on you, that is absolute truth. So these are different ways. As and, I say, uh, and as I said, you, might, you may find that your mother, you may find that you've seen some of these behaviors or maybe even all of them in your mother uh, or one standing out more in particular. So we're all having different experiences, but that was just to give you some examples. So have you experienced any of this growing up with your mother? Again, you can share this with me or you can ask questions if any of this is bringing up questions for you as you listen to this. So what are the consequences of such behavior? Because this is what we're, uh, w that is most important here is to understand whatever the behavior is that your narcissistic mother had, what are the consequences? How is this affecting your life right now? We can't change her behavior. We can't stop her from truth telling. I mean, my mother is whatever age she is now. Um, she does, she's not showing any signs of wanting to change her behavior or stop that in any way, shape or form. So that's not the point of all of this. But the point of all of this is to understand how those behaviors are affecting us, affecting you right now and how they're impacting your life and everything that you do in your life, your life's experience. So the first thing to understand is that as children, we have two fundamental needs as accurately explained by Dr. Gabor Mate. Attachment is one and authenticity is the other. So in order to survive, attachment is the essential one. And for that, a child will sacrifice authenticity. Meaning with a narcissistic mother, a child will take on her truths in order to be accepted and survive. So we grow up taking on a set of beliefs that do not belong to us and that and that can be rather toxic, actually. Okay, they will impact our life not in a good way. And oftentimes, these unhelpful beliefs are deeply rooted in the subconscious. So you may not be aware of them, and yet they rule your life and dictate your experience. It was actually the most intense part of the entire journey for me in healing from my past and from my past with my mother when I started realizing how absolutely everything in my life had been dictated by beliefs I took on from my mother's truth or truths which I had 
kept carrying without realizing. I, I, I didn't know they were there, and yet they were ruling everything. The influence of such truths went everywhere, even in the things I thought I did different from, from my mother. This is where the tricky part was. Y like, there's layers of these beliefs and these truths that we've taken on. So there's like the more superficial ones, and then we go deeper and deeper. And on the surface, it could seem like I was doing a lot very differently from my mother. I was rebelling from her and I wanted to be different than her. But as I went layers and layers deeper, actually at the very <laughs> at the very base of it, there were beliefs that I had taken on from her that were still dictating. So although on the surface it looked different, it actually wasn't really at the end. Um, and so... It's really, really important to, and we're going to see it in a minute, how we're going to work with this, because when these beliefs are rooted in the subconscious and when we're not aware that they're there, we can really be convinced that either we are to blame for the life experience that we're living in the moment or others are to blame or we can find a lot of different reasons why things are not going well and but actually, actually, actually deep down the root is in this subconscious that is driving all the experiences that we have. So I, w I want to give you an example actually of something that happened to me just the other day. I was, and, and, and what actually brought on the inspiration for this episode on top of my past and my mother being a professional truth teller, but also seeing that uh, firsthand as I was at the park with my kids and I overheard a parent say to their child who was crying, um, and I don't, I don't know these people, I was just, I happened to overhear, so I don't know these parents, I don't know this child, I don't know why the child was crying, but that's all irrelevant. What the parent said to their child was, you are only complaining now and that's the truth. I won't have you around if you don't stop. And inside myself, I went, ouch, <laughs> that hurt. That really hurts. So I'm going to say it again. You're only complaining now and that's the truth. I won't have you around if you don't stop. So with what we've just learned about attachment and authenticity, you can see how a simple sentence like that, it's actually really, really hurtful. So, and although the parent might not be a narcissistic parent, as I said, I did, I don't know these people. I am never going to see them again. I, I didn't know them. But there in that moment, <laughs> that was a narcissistic moment, that little snapshot, a moment of dismissing an authentic emotional expression in their child, which is guided by a need the child can't express, or maybe by not having the words yet to articulate what is going on inside them. As children, we don't always have that, you know? Um, we're learning. Children learn their emotional intelligence from their parents. And so when you come into this world as a small child, you don't actually have the words to fully express your needs. Uh, a lot of adults actually can't do that anyways. Um, but like as a child, you can't yet and you have to learn and and also you mightn't have the word you don't have the words to articulate what to explain what emotions are going on inside you you don't have that emotional intelligence yet we learn that in the first few years of our life in the first seven years of our life so um when the parent states like in that case that there's an absolute truth that's the only possibility, you know, you're only complaining now and that's the truth. That's the only possibility. And know what they're experiencing, what the child is experiencing is wrong. And also rejecting their experience, putting a condition to the attachment. I won't have you around if you don't stop. So I haven't asked you, what are you feeling? I haven't asked you, why are you feeling this way? 
uh, I haven't gotten curious in any way, shape or form. There's no honoring of something. Clearly, if there is a complaining, if there is a crying, there has to be something that is bugging you. What is it? How can we, how can I support you in this? What can I do for you? There's none of that. There is a truth and a rejection. And so again, what happens here? The child will learn to deny their emotions and experiences in order to maintain the attachment. So the authenticity goes out the window. Whatever was going on in that moment is shamed and it's made wrong. And so the child has to swallow the whole thing, suppress it, pretend it never happened, and just smile because that's the only way mom and daddy are gonna love me and give me what I need, which is the attachment. Because without the attachment, as a small baby, you're going to die. So it's a survival thing. We are not, it's a subconscious response. As, a ch as, a, as children, we're not in control of that. It just happens because we need the attachment, so it happens. Um, so this was just a little example. And as I said, I don't know those parents, it doesn't matter. But when that is continuously happening, so as, as daughters of narcissistic mothers, we have received that or a form of that continuously, continuously, continuously throughout all of our development. And so again, the authenticity has gone out the window and we have taken on a set of beliefs that drive in from the subconscious and influence the experience that we have in life. So what is the result? To be practical and speaking in simple terms, what is the result of such a behavior long term, such a trauma that is continuous and long term throughout the development, a de developmental trauma, that's what it's called. So number one is living a life that is not yours because you have no idea who you are. I had no idea who I was still working on it, still learning more and more and more about myself every day. Um, but again, w if I don't know who I am, then what sort of a life am I living? Whose life am I living? Am I living the life that my mother wanted me to live or the life that is a reaction to my mother so I'm all rebellious? W what is it, a life that my mother can take and accept or what, what am I living? It's always around her, but it's not actually my life. So that's one. The second thing is believing a whole heap of stuff that is so not true about you, but that you believe it nonetheless because you've been bombarded with this all your life growing up. Believing you're bad, believing you're too sensitive or not sensitive enough. Maybe you believe you're too fat or too thin or incapable of learning or inherently faulty or with no other choice but to work in the job that you don't like or maybe limited by spiritual beliefs that are not yours or absolutely responsible for your mother's emotional state. That's a belief. And I constantly have clients and receive emails from people that are totally swallowed by believing to be responsible for their mother's emotional state. And I was there 100%. So I really hear you on it. Or, pull it, or believing you're undeserving of love or happiness maybe, and so on. So I could continue. All of these beliefs that are holding you back, keeping you stuck, keeping you suffering, keeping you feeling a lot of anxiety and guilt and all sorts of pain. It's the hardest thing. Being inauthentic is the biggest cause of unhappiness for a human being. And again, this is not coming from me, although I've experienced it and I know what it is not to be myself and being aware of it, the more I actually became aware of how much I wasn't being myself and the more the pain <laughs> got more, um, definitely. There is like that say ignorance is bliss. <laughs> when, you, when you don't know, you don't know. But when you start knowing, then it gets even harder. Um, so I get it. But again, these are studies done by a lot of experts in trauma. So it's not just me saying this at all. 
uh, but being inauthentic is really, really painful, is the cause of a lot of unhappiness. So what can we do about all this? Because that's, again, we go back to the important stuff. We understood the mechanism. We get the behavior of our narcissistic mothers. Great. And now what can we do about this? First of all, start by becoming aware of the fact that there are underlying beliefs you may not have identified yet that are indeed dictating your life experience. That's important. And also know that this does not make you bad or wrong and it is not your fault that's really important none of this is your fault none of this makes you bad or wrong those beliefs when we actually start looking at them and becoming aware of them there's some and i speak from experience that are gonna feel really uncomfortable to uncover really uncomfortable none of it makes you bad or wrong it's just the result of being brought up by a narcissistic mother and you're not to blame for taking on such beliefs. So this is really important. We got to start with this foundation because otherwise it gets like, it gets really hard. So really important foundation. Become aware of it, but none of it is your fault. And on the base of that, we go to the second point, which is understanding that as a child, you had no choice. Okay, We said that it was a subconscious response. Choosing attachment over authenticity is not a conscious choice because you're a small child. You <laughs> it's a subconscious survival instinct that kicks in and makes you choose attachment over authenticity. So as a child, you had no choice, but as an adult, you do. Okay, now you do have a choice and you can start exploring what it is to be authentic now. That is essential. As, as a, and as we said, being inauthentic is the biggest source of unhappiness for a human being. So now that you know this, you have the capacity, you have the permission, you can allow yourself, not the permission from me. You definitely don't need my permission from <laughs> for anything. The permission f from yourself to yourself to start exploring what it is to be authentic. So the third point is start allowing these limiting and unhelpful beliefs to come to the surface. Okay, so you've understood the mechanism, you're not gonna blame yourself, you understand you did your best, you had no choice, but now you do. So now you choose to start allowing these limiting beliefs to come to the surface. And how can you do that? So you can ask yourself, when you, when you find yourself in situations where, um, where you feel stuck, where you feel challenged, where things get a little bit tough, um, ask yourself, what belief is dictating my experience right now? What belief is dictating my experience right now? That's a really important question. And then the next question is, is it helpful? Because some belief might be very helpful for you, and that's great. There's no need to work on those. But is the unhelpful one that you really want to work on? Where does this strong belief I have come from? That's another question. So what belief is dictating my experience right now? Is it helpful? And where does it come from? Is it mine or not? That's the key. Is it yours or is it someone else? Is it your voice or is it your mother's voice? Or is it a mix of a lot of voices because there is... We take on our narcissistic mother's voice, we take on society's beliefs, we take on a whole bunch of stuff. So is it yours or is it not? These are really important questions and to start working on this is nearly like something you want to journal on on a daily basis. Um, if journaling is something that you absolutely hate, maybe you can just have internal conversations with yourself on it and reflect on it. I do advise journaling because when something is written, it actually gets moved through the body and goes out onto the paper. And then you can, you can burn it afterwards. You don't have to let, it read, let anyone read it or leave it somewhere where you feel uncomfortable that someone could read it. Burn it. But just the act of putting it out in the open even onto a piece of paper can be really, really healing. So the next point is understand that although there might be a part of you that believes something about you, 
that doesn't define the totality of who you are. And this is really, really key. So once you've identified one belief, for example, with the questions that we talked about a minute ago, then it's really important to understand that it's only a part of you that believes that. That doesn't define you in the totality of you. And this is the very opposite of what a narcissistic mother has done in the past as she so graciously reared us is when there was like a truth was like an all-encompassing you are too sensitive that's it like that's the totality of you that's a massive definition of who you are that's who you are you are too sensitive no but it is a part of you that feels and that is sensitive that's okay and there's also a part of you that can be practical too. I'm just giving an example here. So, you know, I'm in, I'm in, I believe I'm incapable of not feeling anxious. I, I'm an anxious person. No, there's a part of you that, yeah, feels anxiety at times. That's okay. And maybe there's a part of you that feels a lot of anxiety at times, and that's okay. And then there's also a part that doesn't. And the work is to connect to that part, however small it may feel. And just become aware that there is that part. In my personal experience, the part that doesn't feel anxiety, if I go back years ago, it was teeny, 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 tiny. <laughs> like a little drop in the ocean. That's how I felt it was. Um, actually, at the beginning, I didn't believe there was. And then I doing this work, I realized there was this little drop, this little part. And then continuing with the work, the more and more and more I did it, and the more now I can tell that there's two parts and and it's not as small anymore. It's like it's like it's a good enough size that I don't have to live in anxiety constantly all the time anymore. And again, this is a process and it takes time and it takes dedication and it does take work. Um but it's really important. So a part of a, a belief doesn't define the totality of you, it's just a part of you. And the next point and the last point is important in this to seek support. Um, and there is a reason for this, for me saying this. Beliefs that are deeply rooted in the subconscious are often hard to identify by yourself. Okay. That is why we call them blind spots. So this doesn't mean it is impossible for you to get to see them. But often, support and guidance are required. So it's a lot easier for me to, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, guide you to find your blind spots than it is for yourself to see them. In the same way, it's a lot easier for my mentor to guide me and support me in seeing my blind spots. So I'll probably be a lot, a lot more able to see your blind spots than I'll be able to see my own. That's why they're called blind spots because they are hidden in the subconscious. And so we, to bring them to the surface, support and guidance is, I'm gonna say very often, not to say always, but it is needed. Such beliefs live in the shadows of your subconscious and they drive your life from there. So the work is to bring them into the light where you can clearly see them for what they are. They're fake truths you had to take on in order to survive and they're not helpful anymore. So this work to bring them into the light, you might have heard it mentioned and referred to as shadow work. That's what it's commonly known as. I prefer to call it the process of reclaiming your fullness as the words shadow work, like everything else when it becomes popular, can take on many different meanings and interpretation and not all of it is helpful. So um, yeah, if you are hearing it spoken or referred to as shadow work that's what it is it's like bringing becoming aware of what's in your subconscious or what's in, in the shadows of what your blind spots are and then bring them into the light bring them into the surface and then from there once you're aware of it there you, you start playing a different game so the process remains whatever way you want to call it <laughs> it remains a gentle it, should, it definitely should be like that. If it's anything other than this, well, then there is a very strong risk of re-traumatizing the nervous system, which is not helpful. So this type of process is 
gentle, shame and blame free identification of the blind spots beliefs that have been dictated dictating your life without you realizing that okay it's a gentle and shame and blame free identifying of your blind spots that have been dictating your life without you realizing that so that you can break free from their binds and start getting to know yourself in your full unique perfection because you are perfect and amazing as you are with all the parts with all the parts that are that the that create you that make you all the parts that are you and by regaining your authenticity you can start living a way happier life that is fully yours so this is really 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 the core of everything that i do and my work everything that i do in the women's circles everything everything that i do in the one-on-one 10 weeks program is all about this is about regaining your authenticity and it looks different for each one of us it's not like a blueprinted process that is just the same for everyone but it is the one thing that i've re- that i found in my own journey healing mother wounds that has just allowed me to be a lot happier a lot a lot happier in my life there haven't even been but there have been some crazy big changes as a result of this work in my own personal life and then other things haven't really changed much on the surface but what has changed is the energy in me the way i uh, live those experiences now that is completely different and it's my own it's not anymore my mother's and that for me has been like the biggest 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 thing the biggest door opening into a happier happier life so that's why i share this um having lived (laughs) with such a major truth teller like my mother has been for me um i am extremely allergic (laughs) to anyone that tries to impose their truths so the the journey towards authenticity it's really really important um i wanted to share that with you so if you like this episode there's another two episodes that complement this and speak a little bit more on this topic it's episode 40, 41 four steps to liberate from the box your narcissistic mother built around you so that's one you may want to go and listen to and also episode 44 10 ways your narcissistic mother controls your beliefs so both episodes are sort of on the same sort of topic but they take it from different lands so they will complete this and give you a lot more And if you have any more questions on this or you want to share your experience, again, email me at matilde at womenreclaimingtheirfullness.me. And with that, I'm going to wish you a wonderful week, lots of love, and bye for now.